The first portion of this presentation will cover complex peak shapes in the HPLC analysis of fermentation samples. Odd-looking peak shapes are usually a sign of complex mixtures within a peak. Properly processing those peaks can help you to have more confidence in your results. To start, it is important to know that high-pressure liquid chromatography is a technique that takes advantage of specific and nonspecific interactions of mixtures of molecules as they pass through the analytical column to give a chromatogram. If the selection of interactions is appropriate, you get good separation of the molecules. The enhancement of this separation is made by finding the best selection of the mobile phase to work with the stationary phase or column. This is a crude depiction of the separation and detection process. The sample is applied to the inlet of the column, typically by some sort of injection device. This mixture, compounds A and B, have different levels of interaction with the stationary phase. The A component has a much weaker attraction to the stationary phase than does component B. Therefore, the A component elutes through the column at a faster rate. As the two components elute, the differences in the interaction allows the A component to pull away from the B component. As the A component is approaching the outlet end of the column, the B component is still back in the middle of the column. It is important to note that the A component, by virtue of its faster elution, tends to not diffuse as much in the stationary phase packing. Therefore, its elution band occupies less column volume than does the slower eluting B component. This should mean that, for equal sized peaks, the A component peak will be narrower than the B component peak. The A component exits the column and passes through the detector where its response is measured and plotted. The B component is still in the column after the A component has already passed through the detector. Now, the B component exits the column and is detected. The peak shape shows that the B component has been broadened and shortened by the slow relution as compared to the A component. The area of each peak is typically used to quantify each peak, while the retention time can be used to identify the peaks. The typical fermentation sample can be a highly complex mixture of analyte molecules that represent different types of chemistries, physical properties, and molecular sizes. Therefore, it can present a challenge to find a separation methodology that will work with such a diverse set of analytes. To make the analysis cost-effective and timely, a stationary phase matrix and mobile phase are selected that takes advantage of mixed-mode separation mechanisms. Some of the analytes are able to be separated by individual or combined effects of up to four separation mechanisms, including size exclusion, ion exclusion, ion exchange, and hydrophobic interaction. The result is a chromatogram that allows for the analysis of starches, sugars, organic acids, and alcohols. A young fermentation sample is characterized by having high starches and sugars. This places the largest and most complex peaks at the early part of the chromatogram. This can bring on some very difficult peak processing challenges as the makeup of the early peaks should be considered to be as unseparated mixtures. On these high starch chromatograms, it is not uncommon to find that the DP4 plus peak is not well shaped and may not well separate from the DP3 peak. This is certainly a sign that the DP4 plus peak is an aggregate of several molecular types. Old fermentation samples have nearly run their course. The ethanol is very high and the sugars and starches have been depleted. This produces its own set of challenges in that during the fermentation, very many minor byproducts have been produced and they represent the bumps in the baseline. With an interest in trying to report a specific number for a specific material like glucose, the end user may be fooled by these minor byproducts. Much of the peak processing difficulties is caused by co-eluting materials. Whether the co-elution is due to impurities, contaminants, or materials of interest, it still makes peak processing a difficult decision. Let us look at a pair of analytes, A and B. 
In this case, each analyte should produce a peak of equal size, 1,780 area each. If those two peaks are reasonably, but not necessarily completely separated, processing seems to be fairly clear. The easiest way to process these peaks is to split the two peaks at the valley between them. If you were able to see each peak in the partially co-alluded pair, you would see that the valley is actually the result of an additive effect of the intensities from each analyte. Therefore, the valley is twice as high as the crossover point of the two analytes. Splitting the peak at this point evenly splits the amount of each peak that appears under the other. This evenly distributes the peak areas and both peaks are processed to a peak area of 1,780. If the peaks co-elute much closer, then the situation seems worse, but the peak areas are still evenly distributed at 1,780 each. This is due to the equal size of the two analyte peaks. The splitting at the valley between the peaks evenly splits and distributes the mixed areas from each peak. If the coevolution is even closer, the resulting additive effect may make the two peaks elute as a single peak. If this is the case, there may be no way to split the peaks, and the resulting mixed peak is the sum of the peak areas, or 3,560. Let's now look at a similar comparison, though with differently sized peaks. In this case, the A peak by itself would generate an area of 1,780, and the B peak would generate an area of 872. When the peaks are nearly separated, there is a small shift in area toward the B component. This is caused by splitting the peak at the valley and having a larger trailing edge from the A peak contribute to the B peak area. While the shift is only small, only four area counts in this case, it would be worse if the smaller peak was smaller still. When the peaks begin to move closer, it is possible for the smaller component to lose much of its identity. The smaller peak becomes more of a shoulder on the side of the larger peak. Processing of this is also done by splitting the shoulder from the larger peak, but there may not be a defined valley to use as a processing point. In the example shown, the minimum point of the shoulder was used as a splitting point, and the peak areas add more to the A component, 1853 instead of 1780, and less to the B component, 799 instead of 872. This inaccuracy in the assignment of peak areas is a consequence of not getting better peak separation. As you would expect, moving the two peaks closer together does result in a single peak, though it may start to look even more misshapen. The peak areas are fully additive, but it is not realistic to get a value for each component. Next, let's look at a more complex mixture of components. Here, three components are eluded with either no separation or very poor separation. This could be further complicated by adding in two more peaks that, relative to the first three, may be fairly well separated, but they are not that well separated from one another. Now, add a sixth peak in the middle of the pack. Throw in two more unseparated materials for a total of eight. What would the aggregate peak look like from the detection of these eight materials eluding from the column? Unofficially, I would refer to this as a lumpogram. It looks somewhat familiar. Ah, I thought I had seen that peak shape somewhere before. The question now becomes, is there any hope of getting usable data from this type of peak shape? The answer is that yes, you can get data, but you may have to adjust your expectations. For the peak that is an aggregate of several co-eluting analytes, there is little expectation of getting individual analyte responses, but it should be able to work if you use the analytes as a group. With grouping, the sum of the analyte areas is calibrated to the expected total amount in the group. With DP4+, it is already acknowledged that the peak is representative of several analytes. Therefore, the DP4 plus peak in the standard is already using a grouping determination.
the young fermentation samples are even more complex than the DP4 Plus standard, which is usually a maltodextrin. If you are fortunate enough to get the DP4 Plus peak to be integrated as a single peak, then there is nothing more that needs to be done. Some laboratories would look at this separation of DP3 and DP4 Plus and realize that the DP3 peak will not yield an accurate area determination. These labs will create a DP3 plus group which combines the areas for all peaks from DP4 plus through DP3. The calibration of the group is done on the total of the individual amounts for DP4 plus and DP3 in the standard. The response factor for the group would be a weighted average based on the relative sizes of the peaks and the results for the group and fermentation samples would be weighted by that same ratio. Here is an extreme example of DP4 plus peak processing. This is from an operating ethanol production facility. As you can see, the starch peak area seems to be split into several slices. In the expanded view, it is clear that as an individual peak, that only the first section of the starch peak area is being labeled as DP4 plus. So only that peak area is being used to calculate the DP4 plus concentration. That would be ignoring the two large portions of the starch peak that would go uncalculated. By setting a DP4 plus group that would include any peak whose apex is within the time range, the areas for all three of the starch peaks would be combined and calculated against the response factor for the DP4 plus peak in the calibration standard. There could still be some concern over the accuracy of the DP3 peak since it is such a slight shoulder on the sides of the starch group. Using the individual determination or DP3 assumes a lot from the peak processing. It may be better from a processing accuracy standpoint to create a DP3 plus group that combines all the DP3 and DP4 plus peaks into a single calibrated entity. We would all like to see our processing be on peaks that look as nice as the calibration standard as shown here. However, you must realize that the DP4 plus peak is a mixture. I have had requests for methodology that would give a much better separation for all the starches and sugars. It is possible. Here is maltodextrin, the DP4 plus peak standard material, analyzed using a hydrophilic interaction separation technology with a grading dilution of acetonitrile in water. It shows that maltodextrin contains a series of linear dextrins out to at least DP30. In the enzymatic starch degradation, it is possible to get a variety of branch dextrins as well that will give rise to differing elution times and therefore changing the peak shape. Using the same technology to analyze a carbohydrate mixture, it is clear to see that it is possible to get much more highly resolved peaks. So why don't all the plants switch to this HPLC technology? Cost and time. The HPLC equipment is considerably different pricier and does not tolerate a dusty environment well. The mobile phase containing acetonitrile is much more expensive to purchase and could be a problem to properly dispose of. And lastly, the analysis time can easily be 45 to 60 minutes per injection with up to 15 minutes between analyses to re-equilibrate the column. This type of equipment is more likely to be found in a research laboratory.